Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Zoom chat here <laughs> for our opening and artist talk with Christy Gordon, whose uh, exhibition Planetary is currently gracing our walls at the Langham um, in Caslow, BC, which I'd like to recognize is on the unceded uh, territories of the Sinex, Tanaha, Okanagan, and Shuswap nations. I'm Cethra Bell, the curator. And um, I'll just go over a few things and let you know how we're going to do this today so we're all on the same page. Um, Christy would like it if we could all ask questions or make comments through the chat box. I'll be monitoring that and uh, verbalizing the questions to her for you just so that we don't have a bunch of people trying to jump in at the same time just to keep it kind of organized. Um, we are also recording this uh, for the future option of putting it out there into the world. So if you don't want your face up, now would be a good time to turn your video off. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, this is a really exciting exhibition right now. And I'm really excited to have such an amazing and skilled artist as Christy join us um, and show her artwork in our small community. Um, this also has got quite a bit of press, which is really exciting. Uh, Galleries West, Fine Art Connoisseur, and Realism Today have done write-ups. Kootenai Co-op Radio has um, done an interview with Christy, and it's a really good one. You should check that out. Uh, we also have a really neat video that I think Christy's going to show us, uh, made by a local videographer, Louis Bachner. And we also have a gallery tour up on our website, so you can check it out even if you can't join us in person, which would be great. So I think that's all I need to tell you for the tidbits. And now let's talk a bit about Christy before she jumps in with more information for you. So Christy has exhibited in Canada, the US, Europe, and China. She received her BFA from the Ontario College of Art and Design and her MFA from the New York Academy of Art, where she also teaches um, sometimes. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, she's represented in over 600 collections worldwide, including the Government of Ontario's Art Collection and the Touchstones Museum of Art and History here in Nelson. Um, so we're just really excited to have somebody who's this well-renowned at our little gallery. Uh, so without any further ado, Christy, if you hear me, you... I do. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's so good to see you all. I've sort of scrolled through some of your names, looking at the videos of who all's here, and it's so good to see so many familiar faces. So thanks for being here, everyone. And thank you so much, Sitra, for curating the show and all you've done for the show and, and to Paul as well. Um, yeah, it's been so great to work with you guys and the Langham for having me in the gallery. Um, yeah, and, and as Sifra mentioned, um, uh, we've got a really amazing video that was made by Louis Bachner that I thought I would just uh, share with you guys first. It just kind of gives you um, a look into my studio practice and also into some, you know, you can see some installation shots of the show. It's just like a five minute video and I'll just share my screen so you can, we'll watch that first and then we'll kind of take a look at some of the paintings in the show and talk a little bit more in depth um, about them. So I'm just expanding my view here. And yeah, here's the video. I'm Christy Gordon and I grew up around the Kootenays and I've always loved painting. I um, started exhibiting around the Kootenays at an early age. I was always painting people around me. A lot of my earlier works were like figurative and a little bit gestural, a little, little bit colorful. And some of this recent work has in some ways returned to that multi-figure um, sort of element of painting the people around me. 
So I've been working on these pieces in the show that's called Planetary um, for about three, even four years. And interestingly, the themes that I was working on in the beginning, like four years ago, they really lent themselves to like what started happening in the world. And it was kind of mystical in that way that the themes I was like exploring really sort of came to the forefront, like in the last year or so with a sense of transition in the whole entire world and um, the sense of struggle, but also like mutual co cooperation and all the activist movements of our time really coming up as well. I like my paintings to speak on multiple levels. So there's what the painting says on the surface, what the imagery is and, you know, the textures and things like that. But there's also kind of a dialogue happening beneath the surface, talking to the history of art um, with references, quotes from different artists, you know, po uh, quoting poses and things like that. And in that way, um, so artists like Michelangelo or Piero della Francesca were like white male artists painting for you know the church. And so I'm kind of painting myself into this exclusionary history and my friends and the people around me inserting contemporary themes and just more, uh, you know, women are often the center of interest in my work or and there's more like diversity in the crowds. And yeah, just sort of using that language of history painting in a way that uh, feels more true to me. So a lot of the time I start with like a loose sketch, just very scribbly, um, just to sort of getting an idea out. And then I basically just start in on the full size painting right away and work intuitively and just notice any like creative impulse that comes and just try it out, just like winging it. From there, there's a lot of compositional decisions to make to sort of uh, work out any like you know, any kind of tangents or just things that need to get worked out. A lot of the sketches that I do are maybe initially inspired by like a piece of art that I've seen. Not all the time. Sometimes it starts with some other idea from life. Like this one, um, there's a lot of different art where like there's two mystical creatures on either side of kind of this tree of life plant sort of thing happening. So it kind of starts with an idea that's very simple. It's kind of like that. And then I see where I can take it with the... Um, adding contemporary elements and making it my own concept. A lot of my paintings do have this contrast between seemingly opposing forces like death and rebirth or like lightness and spiritual darkness, kind of that sense of struggle as well as like hope and strength. Um, and in like philosophy, there's the idea that these polar oppositions are actually two sides of the same thing. You can't have one without the other. So when I'm painting things like still lives, like, you know, flowers or, you know, I kind of include that element like the Dutch still lives of Vanitas where there's decaying flowers or insects or, you know, even in my paintings of um, crowds, there's often like skeletons dancing around in the background to kind of get at that cyclical nature of endings and beginnings, death and rebirth. that video by Louis. I think he's such an amazing filmmaker. And um, yeah, so what I thought we could do next is just take a look. I'll sort of talk a bit about, you know, the story behind some of the paintings and some of the symbolism in the work. And, um, and what you guys can do is just if you have any questions or thoughts, you can just type it into the chat box and see through will just, um, you know, chime in and sort of read your questions out to me so that I don't um, miss anything. I'm just adjusting my screen here so you can see the whole painting. So this painting here is called The Cosmic Lotus and it's one of the earlier pieces in the show. I started it about three or maybe three and a half years ago and um, it really embodies this idea of like you know binary oppositions with the lightness and spiritual darkness embedded in the weather patterns um, and that's kind of interwoven into the still life in the foreground too with the uh, inspiration from the Dutch Vanitas paintings, you know, little insects or like decaying flowers, um, you know, that sort of nod to death and the cyclical nature of like death and rebirth. Um, and, and some of the flowers in the foreground here are flowers from the Kootenays. So if you, you know, live in the Kootenays, you all know the tiger lilies and the, the buttercups and, 
uh, you know, roses that I would see in people's gardens, um, you know, as I were, was working on it. And then the central flower, which is sort of conceived of as the cosmic lotus, is kind of uh, a nod to hope, like hopefully coming out of this kind of dismay and conflict that seems to be ensuing in the background. Um, and it's more of a fantastical flower, kind of a hybrid flower, just as this is actually kind of a mystical creature, sort of a hybrid. So I was kind of exploring ways of having this, you know, illusionary painting technique, but having it, um, yeah, done in such a way that uh, even the imaginal sort of figures sort of uh, fit into the whole scheme. Um, so that, that was some of my intentions in the work. I can't see the chat box, but if, if there's any thoughts or yeah. questions. <laughs> okay, and so you guys can go ahead. If I, um, if anyone wants to unmute too, you can raise your hand. I'd love to just keep this like kind of conversational so that um, we can just, you know, chat about the work and yeah. So if you, if you either raise your hand, I can unmute you or if you um, wanna chat in the chat box and we'll just sort of move through um, the paintings kind of one at a time and um, Rick, if somebody's asking could you please zoom in on the house in the background ah yes huh. this is my house that I grew up in Nelson used to be a white house with blue trim it's not actually the same shape but I think that played into my um my making the house a white house with blue trim and then you know there's like a swimming pool we never had a swimming pool growing up or anything but and and meanwhile there's kind of this battle going on in um, this urban setting. And yeah. we have another question here, Christy, from Diana saying, is something on fire? Yeah, so there's kind of this crowd here. I was looking at, um, you know, Renaissance artists. All I love all the paintings, um, you know, by like Pierre della Francesca, especially at the Church of Francesca in Arezzo that have um, like battle scenes on horses and stuff. So I was looking at those, but then the figures, most of them are my friends. Um, and then there's like a fire, uh, a flag, flags on fire. It's uh, pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then the next painting here is called. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. One more just came in. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, uh, no, go ahead. Uh, Aaron is asking Does the big bumblebee have any significance to you? Well, bees are just so important in this world. Like, I think, isn't there an, isn't there, it's like a fact that like bee populations are going down, and I think they get kind of like messed up by all the digital. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert, but I think they get messed up by all the digital signals going around in the world and we need bees to live. They create, um, po they transport pollen and that's how we get, you know, fruit and stuff. So the bee is definitely very important. Yeah. And we have another from Donna. <laughs> um, let's see here. She says, you refer to starting the painting three years ago. Does it take that long to gestate the painting? Are you painting uh, a single piece for years at a time? That is such a good question. It did take three years to gestate this painting and that's a really good word for it um, because I just didn't always know what I wanted to, the painting to be. It kind of like revealed itself to me over time. So I needed time with it. And um, it actually went through a lot of phases where I actually like literally thought of giving up on it, you know, um, but then I would just try something else and just kind of keep going with it. And in the end, I'm really happy with this piece, but and I'm relieved that I finished it because it hit a lot of points where I just didn't know what to do on it. And I did almost give up. Maybe I even gave up at times, but then somehow I returned to it. But they don't always take that long. That's probably about the longest anything has ever taken me. Like, yeah. And Paul jumps in asking, uh, you said you start with a basic sketch and then jump into the work. So you don't generally have the full composition when you start, it evolves as you go. Yeah, I sort of figured that out about my process in the course of producing the paintings for my for this show. Um, like some artists can like have an idea and do all these sketches, like beautiful finished sketches that are like, a blueprint for how the painting will look, but I just can't do that. Like, um, I just don't, that's not the way ideas come to me. So I could try to do that, but then the painting would totally change anyways, like while I'm working on it. And also I might get overwhelmed 
and never be able to figure it out. Like I actually am more of a painter than a drawer. So I almost need to push colors around to sort of see how shapes are working. So when I'm just drawing or something, I can't really like do it the way I need to sort of do it. So I did discover in the course of making these paintings that I actually just need to kind of work what I call intuitively, where I'm just like trying something and then basically assessing it for compositional issues. Like a lot of it is just like, looking at shapes and the way they work and then kind of shifting making adjustments like once I've tried something that's a go and we it looks like we just have one more question on this one um okay. says do the people in your mind do the people on horseback have an ultimate destination <laughs> mm. and also quickly just in relation to the painting as well about the size of the painting Oh, oh, good question. So it's about four feet, about maybe five feet by eight feet. It's 60 inches by 96 inches. So um, people are often surprised how big it is when they see it in life, when they've only seen it like on a screen. And I wouldn't, I don't know if the pain, the people have a destination, but I like that question. Their destination is the future. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, we have some more comments. Uh, the lighter strip along the bottom is an interesting compositional element. Uh, could you expand on that or have any thoughts about that? Actually, I totally have thoughts about that. I, I'm so glad that you noticed that. That is one of the cases, there's a few cases in these paintings where I'm kind of like thwarting, like the picture is, you know, a painting is sort of supposed to be like a window, like a window into a painting. And so for it to all make sense, it needs to be like contained within this window. So having this little white band at the bottom and then bringing the flowers like past that window, it just like throws off the whole thing. Uh, and I kind of like that. Um, yeah, it's, I just like, uh, it's hard to actually put into words, but I like the way it's kind of like messing with what a painting usually does. That's not very well put. Does that even make sense? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then you just have a lovely compliment here from Erin saying, magnificent work, Christy. It looks like it would be at home in the Louvre. Aw, yeah. thanks, Erin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Yeah, these are great questions, too. Um, this is another painting that I did that really, this one really blends like working from life, working from a live model. This is my friend from around the Kootenays who I actually paint a lot. So she posed for um, me from life and then finding ways to kind of incorporate my imagination um, into it and, and sort of finding ways to make it all look cohesive in the end. And we've got, you know, this fire in the background, sort of a symbol, a symbol of transformation and the burning up of the old. And yet we're not yet at the next, you know, the new phase. Um, and just, you know, this idea of people's relationship with the environment and the natural world. Um, and there's often in my work sort of a sense of ambiguity. So, you know, bunnies are cute, but you can't quite tell whether these bunnies are friendly or threatening. Um, they look a little bit eerie. And I always like that kind of ambiguity in my work. Yeah. Right, so I think, well, you sort of just touched on that. Paul is asking uh, if the hairs have a specific meaning to you. Well, to me, um, I think it's like, hmm, I guess it's more just that ambiguity. I like, yeah, I really like that they're like um, a bit eerie, but also a bit cute. And I like they're like glowing weird ears. It's more, I think it's more visual. Uh, for me, I wouldn't say it's like a specific, I think a lot of the time there's more of a feeling in my work than like a nailed down like specific sort of like meaning that I, I want to have come across in the work. So I think this is one of those pieces for me. And how, uh, what is the measurement on this one, Christy? This is a medium sized painting. So it's 24 inches by 20 inches. Okay. Yeah. And um, how do you determine the scale of your work? Um. It, uh, that's a really good question. I think it's sort of just how I feel. Like I just like in my studio practice to have like a big one, like a giant one, one that I'm working on, like the painting that's on my screen background. Um, and then also have some like smaller ones that I can be working on. And I think a painting like this just feels right. Like the figure is about life size, which I thought felt about right for this, for this particular piece. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's see, what else do we got coming in? Interesting that you mentioned they can be a bit scary. I thought about the carnivorous rabbit on Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the, uh, Donna saying that the ambigu ambigu ambiguity comes across. I feel very uncomfortable with the possibility of sharp claws right at her jugular vein. <laughs> That's true. That's um, well put. I never really thought about the exact placement. Yep, totally. And then there could also be a sense of tenderness, like a little soft paw caressing the, the, uh, the neck. So totally. And uh, Aaron yeah, like that. is uh, commenting that the background is uh, almost has a bit of a dolly vibe to it. Oh, for sure. I love surrealists. Like, yeah, I can see Dolly. I, um, there's another really amazing surrealist, not so well known, Leonora Carrington. Um, and yeah, I just love the surrealist movement. I think it's really, really great. Yeah, that's a good, good eye. And uh, somebody else is inquiring, sorry, just before you flip, Christy, about is there a significance in the leopard spots? Or is that just a fashion? <laughs> It is both. Like, I guess when I first conceived of the painting, I almost thought of ha her um, having these leopard spots and, and it not being a shirt. It's sort of her kind of being like an animal. It was definitely like inspired by fashion and the fact that I bought a shirt like this as well. Um, as it, you know, as it progressed, I just actually ended up wanting to have it be, be a shirt. But I guess it's also kind of tying in the idea of like her being a part of nature and being, you know, animal as well yeah excellent questions thank you for those um uh, yeah and then this next painting also really embodies the idea of transition it's called liminality and so we've got you know the big fire big explosion in the background and sort of the sense of chaos and struggle um but also a sense of like mutual cooperation and people helping each other through the struggle We've got a nod to Piero della Francesca over here. This is um, one of the figures in his um, frescoes in Arezzo. Um, I love Piero della Francesca. And then, and you know, that along with like the curtain that's being drawn uh, really sort of conflates our sense of like what is real, what is unreal, along with the like Wi-Fi modem in the corner here, which could also be a nod to like the simulation hypothesis, like the idea that we're living in a simulated world. So yeah, just lots of conflating of what's real and what's unreal and, and then moving through struggles. Okay, so we have a, a comment from June. Uh, she's so happy to see this exhibit in a local gallery. She can't wait to come see it in person. Uh, which artists are you inspired by? Can't help but think of Kent Monkman when I look at your work. Oh, totally. Yeah, I love Kent Monkman. Actually, I went to the Met recently, maybe it was like last year or something like that. I don't remember exactly. And he's got two giant paintings up at the Met now, which I'm so proud of him. I mean, he's like so amazing. I love Kent Monkman. So yeah, definitely him. Also like Bosch, um, you know, Hieronymus Her Miss Bosch and the Italian Renaissance artists like Piero della Francesca and uh, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, all of those Italian Renaissance artists. Um, and also there's an American artist, Julie Heffernan, that really does work that sort of deals with climate change and ecology, and I love her work too. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, Sarah is saying, uh, we're enjoying all the references to historical masterpieces, commenting on them is very interesting. So she's, that's Thank appreciated. You. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting too. I think it adds a layer to the work. And it's like, you don't miss it if you don't know it, but I like it when you do have that knowledge of our history, when you can sort of, you know, identify, you know, some of the references or some of the poses being quoted and um, how I'm sort of using that language to insert contemporary themes and more uh, images of like women and, um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, I'm glad you like that. Thank you. And we have Erin asking, um, are the two girls in red skirts supposed to be twins? Yeah, they're kind of like doppelgangers. It's like, and actually they're both me. And again, I just felt also like that adds like a little bit of an eerie sort of this to, um, to the painting, which I kind of enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lynn has a comment. She says, the woman gardening must have an incredible green thumb. The size of that pickling cucumber is proof. <laughs> <laughs> I always do <laughs> oversized fruits and vegetables. I think it looks good and, 
It's true. It's absolutely giant. This is actually inspired by um, um, wait, what's his name? I'm forgetting his name right now, but an amazing artist who you know I've seen at the Met. Um, right now his name's actually escaping me, but um, he often does this fruit like this like giant cucumber sort of around like the Mother Mary or something, and it's like um, just really interesting to me. I think in some ways taking references like that almost kind of for me highlight how weird some of that stuff is like I think we look at art from you know historical art and sometimes we just accept it but we don't notice how weird it actually is and I kind of enjoy like highlighting that aspect <laughs> all right uh Donna saying can you put the female artist from the states name in the chat Julie with question marks oh uh, for sure the one who did some climate change imagery Definitely. I don't know if I can get, I can't, right now I can't access the chat, but maybe Seathrow, do you want to type it? It's Julie, J-U-L-I-E, and then space Heffernan, H-E-F-F-E-R-N-A-N, -F -F -E Julie Heffernan. Yeah, she's a contemporary, uh, yeah, figurative artist. She's amazing. Excellent. I I like her. Yeah. Okay, and we have, uh, hi, Christy, it's Dulce. Are you inspired hi. by... <laughs> uh, are you inspired by theater and the French tableau vivant, which were carefully co uh, posed scenes, sort of like a still? Ooh, that's interesting. Actually, I want to look more at theater. Um, I did start going to like more theater like last year or whenever it was before the pandemic hit, and I started to really like realize that I could draw a lot of inspiration. Um, from it. I actually am not familiar with that like particular reference that you made, but it sounds very interesting. I'm going to check that out. Um, but I definitely think it's like a great place to draw inspiration from. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have one final comment from Angelica or Angelica. Um, amazing how so many ideas and themes incorporated in all of the imagery. So much to look at in these beautiful paintings. Oh, thanks, Angie. Yeah, I definitely like to incorporate a lot of images. <laughs> There's lots of inspiration to draw on as an artist in this world. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is another painting where I was like blending um, painting from life with painting from the imagination. And um, yeah, and really like kind of getting to know my, um, I'm actually going to open two videos here, my own sort of process like I think as an artist it sometimes takes us a little bit of time to figure out like our own process so this video kind of shows how as I work intuitively I'm just like following every impulse that I get and just trying it out and I'll play it again sort of working through things and and working through it until it feels right but it changes a lot along the way um, just finding a way to like get that representation but also having the uh, you know imaginary elements in it and then I also figured out in this painting that it worked really well for me to actually paint in the Natural History Museum in New York as I get into the final details so this is just a video panning over to some of the dioramas I was looking at in the Natural History Museum um, yeah it's like one of my favorite things to do actually and yeah you know the skeletons in the background dancing around sort of that memento mori element and and the snakes and yeah so it was um really fun to kind of start to figure out how to blend the imagine imaginary like elements with these more illusionistic like representational sort of treatment mm -hmm. uh, okay so um we have a question from Gwen. did you have to get permission to paint there I guess she I do it. have permission and it is quite wonderful. I think anyone can paint in there, you know, but you have to deal with the crowds like as a normally, but I actually have, I'm part of this special group that we get to go in on an evening when it's just us alone with the dioramas and like a couple of the cleaning staff, you know, people who know me and are really nice. And it's, that's my favorite thing to do. So nobody else is around. It's like totally just like you and the animals and like little mice <laughs> run by. <laughs> so it's, sometimes it's a little bit creepy, but it's great. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, so Aaron has two things to say in all caps. Oh my God, I love this. No. Uh, uh, what are the ruins in the background? Oh, so yeah, those they're you know they I'm sure there's something specific, but actually I'm sort of just uh, making a nod to sort of the ancient world and just history and uh, 
you know, where we came from and, and also kind of this loss of knowledge about where we came from. But that's a good question. You know, I actually don't know specifically what this is and I actually should know that. So thank you, I'm gonna investigate that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now between Donna and Paul, what is the significance of the horse in her lap? It just seems so odd. And Paul <laughs> saying, who is the main figure and what does she represent? Yeah, so she, um, she is a friend of mine in New York and she was posing for me. And the horse is very odd. I mean, it was like actually something that we took from the room where we were painting. My friend has like lots of stuff and we decided to have her holding this horse. She's holding it in a way that's kind of like quoting a lot of um, po like the poses of like um, the hand of like sort of a Mother Mary type of pose or something. It's like a really beautiful hand, but the horse is kind of a um, like a toy horse, a wooden horse, and she's surrounded by all these like animals. So um, I, I think, yeah, it's kind of like uh, she's part of nature, but she's also not entirely like like part of it, I guess. Um, and it's called Beautiful Dangerous. Uh, yeah, I'm, again, I'm sort of thinking of her as being like part of this um, this sort of web of, of animals, but also somehow slightly disconnected from it. Mm -hmm. All right, and it looks like we have one more comment from Karen saying, wow, your imagination and references are so inspiring. <laughs> Aww, thank you. Thank you very much. So, oh, and then this, this painting here is called Artificial Light. This is a piece where it's actually a lot smaller than you might think. It's only 10 inches by 20 inches. So, you know, it's like kind of roughly about two letter sized pieces of paper put together. Um, and uh, I was inspired by Diego Rivera, um, some images at the Whitney that I saw, some paintings at the Whitney, um, kind of this idea of people sort of stuck in the machine. And so this painting is kind of like a nod to the digital era and like the proliferation of social media. And I kind of like how at first glance, it looks like it's just an image of the cosmos. But as you look more closely, you can kind of see that this is actually a giant um, iPhone and it's like beaming its artificial light, like hence the title onto the crowd of people. Um, the, the figures are all my friends so I can like identify who exactly each and every one of them is, my friends and their kids. And, you know, they're kind of struggling but also there's like moments of tenderness and, and they're sort of trying to reconnect with the earth, with the uh, hybrid mystical creatures in the background, maybe helping them unbeknownst to them in the background. Moving to this painting here, this is called uh, Self-Portrait on Horse. And it's actually the very earliest piece that I did in the show. Um, it's 14 inches by 11 inches, it's pretty small. And it's really, I'm seeking to like dismantle gendered hierarchies in this piece between like high art and illustration and craft too. So, I uh, actually beaded, done some like beadwork directly into the canvas, which was really interesting to do, like to really realize canvas is fabric and you can actually bead right into it. And it was fun to learn how to do beadwork. And, but it, um, you know, I was drawing inspiration from um, David's painting of Napoleon, but really capturing how I felt uh, in 2016 at the end of the American presidential election. Yep. <laughs> And this one, the size is quite small. Sorry, Christy, someone just asked in the size again. Yeah, it is small. It's only 14 inches by 11 inches. So just a little bit bigger than paper size. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that really lends itself. It was, if it was too much, I don't know, it just worked well for, this, for the beading. Yeah. Mm. And what, uh, if we just look back quickly, uh, just a question about the size of Beautiful Dangerous. Yeah, that one is also smaller than you might think. It's 16 inches by 20 inches. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a small painting. Her face is actually incredibly small and I had to buy like the smallest brush of the highest quality <laughs> to be able to get into the details of her face, which I painted from life. So that helps you kind of capture like better colors, like the cools and the warms. You can just see that kind of thing when you're painting from life and a photo doesn't capture those kind of uh, colors. Yeah. All right, and uh, we have uh, back to the self-portrait one. We have Sandra saying that she loves the actual beadwork in the painting. So in, she's in, you. Did you incorporated that, I guess. 
Thank you. It was really interesting to learn how to do beadwork. There's some, I, uh, I, you know, I didn't actually do an absolutely great job. It's a very difficult skill, um, but I did learn how to do it. And it was really interesting to kind of figure it out in this painting. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting combination uh, that is, you don't usually see. It's really striking. Thanks. Yeah, it, um, I think I was inspired by Florence Stettheimer, um, at the um, Jewish Museum or something like that. I forget the name of it in New York. She she was doing a lot of kind of playful uh, things like this, incorporating like beading and stuff into her, into her paintings. And we have another question from Sherlyn. Hi, Sherlyn. Hey, Sherlyn. Uh, <laughs> what is the significance of the knife? The knife, well, protection and sort of like, yes, yeah, self-protection or, uh, anger too, like it was like just out of the American presidential election of 2016 and I was living in New York and it was like a pretty intense time. Um, so I would say it has a lot to do with like anger and self-protection. And I'm in a bathing suit, so I'm feeling pretty vulnerable. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that is, uh, okay, so we have some a couple more coming in here. So uh, Jerry is saying, it's nice that the figure's leg still projects forward uh, despite the beating, it still uh, sits to the towards the front of the painting on top yeah. of the beating. That's a, a really good observation. I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot to mention that. I actually used like modeling paste to build up this knee because since the beading stick out like stuck out from the canvas, like physically too far out, if the painting was just flat, then it would look like really ridiculous. Like that knee has to be in front of that beading. So I built it up with um, modeling paste and then painted it. Uh, with the exact intention of having the knee like come forward in front of the beating. It was, that was actually kind of challenging. I'm glad you noticed that. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. uh, Carol is saying, the horse seems to be more important than you in this painting. Was that intentional? And what does the horse represent? That's very cool. Um, I don't know if I have like a perfect answer for that. Although the idea of the horse can sort of like, also represent our relationship with the body too. So mm, I would have to give that more thought. Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lynn is saying, I love the shadow from the beads painted in on the side of the horse's head. Oh, that's such a good observation. I'm so impressed with you guys. <laughs> yeah, I actually switched color of beads right there so that since there's a cast shadow on the head, the beads would also turn into the cast shadow. And there's like a point somewhere, I'm trying to remember where it was, where that didn't work so well. And so I actually put a glaze on top of the beads to like make them darken. It might have been on these gold beads right here to make them darken into the shadows as well. That's a really good eye. I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Sherlyn is just inquiring, um, are all the paintings done in oil? Yeah, yep, they're all done in oil. Um, sometimes I start with uh, like acrylic to sort of play around with shapes in the very like first pass, not all the time, but sometimes they've got like acrylic first and then oil on top, but ultimately they're oil paintings. Lovely. Yeah. Excellent. Wow. Well, really good obser observations and questions, everyone. It's very cool. Uh, this is another giant painting. This one's about four feet by eight feet, and it was started about at the same time as Cosmic Lotus. Um, and so it took even longer, actually. I just finished it last year. And I was really inspired by artists of the Italian Renaissance, like Piero della Francesca and Fra Angelico, who do these like interior exterior paintings. Um, and I sort of wanted to try doing like my own sort of contemporary like version of that. Um, uh, so yeah, I was like drawing inspiration from the people around me and the world around me. And since I was developing it over so much time, as I developed it, I was kind of able to like embed in like a general way, some of the, um, you know, events uh, that were starting to happen, some of the social justice and activist movements. Um, and I, my intention was to do it in a general way, not just depicting like a specific historical event, but sort of more capturing like the sort of mood of the time. And yeah, and then we've got like the skeletons that sort of memento mori 
element sort of dancing around, which, you know, initially they're really just like a memento mori, like the sense of the cyclical nature of life and death. But as the painting progressed, you know, and then the pandemic hit, the skeleton really also became like a symbol of the pandemic. So it was interesting to see how the meaning of the painting kind of evolved uh, as I finished it off. And then the, the title of the painting, The Strangled Planet, is actually lyrics taken from my favorite punk band from when I was a teenager. So I kind of um, enjoy that on a personal note. Um, Michelle is asking, how long did it take to finish that painting? This one did take, like technically, like from actual beginning of the first brush stroke to very last brush stroke, about like four years. But I put it down for like maybe two years, you know, and just didn't know what to do with it. And then came back to it and worked on it some more. And it's a piece that I really feel like uh, I started, it was like one, it's one of the most ambitious paintings that I've ever done. And I started it as a person who couldn't paint a painting like this and had to sort of work on it and figure it out long enough that he, I sort of in the process became a person who could paint something like this. So. And you did. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is asking, what is the animal that the unicorn is spearing and does it have any particular inspiration? Oh, yeah. These, uh, most of these dogs are taken from a Rubens painting at the Met, uh, or they're like inspired by a Rubens painting. And like, this is also kind of ambiguous. Like it's, um, it's interesting because the unicorn maybe could be uh, like our, divine feminine sort of uh, vulnerable aspect, but she has to like protect herself. So she's kind of also like attacking as well, which is like a bit of a shock, like what the unicorns attacking the dog. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's so many, it's, uh, I like the idea that like, it's not always clear, like who's the perpetrator and who's the victim and it like situations can be very complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have, Let's see now, who's next? <laughs> uh, we've got Michelle saying, this one also feels like it could be influenced by Diego Rivera's murals. Oh, well, I did see them. I saw so many things like in the course of painting this painting. Um, and I like that. I love Diego Rivera's like murals. I think they're so amazing. Um, I saw the show Vida Americana at the Whitney like in the course of painting this. and. There was like so many amazing works by Diego Rivera and some of the Mexican muralists. And um, I mean, the scale, I guess, like ties into that too. So yeah, I, I like that idea. Okay. Uh, Joni is asking how much of the planning is done before you even begin to paint? Like I try sometimes to plan it out and I might have a loose idea and sort of do some sketches, but then I really like to just like dive into paint and just start to try it out and like, um, yeah, and for me, it really is all about shapes and colors and sort of, and it's like I can feel better whether it works like once I start painting it. So in the end, like what you end up seeing, like almost all of it was just done like on the canvas in paint, but it definitely like started as a couple sketches, but they pretty much went out the window once I started really getting into it. <laughs> uh, okay, um, Diana is saying, I recognize your playful reference to the angel visiting Mary in the right area, in the area on the right hand side. Oh, for sure. Some of these angels, most of them, all of them are references to some piece of art. Like, um, so there's, yeah, I was really actually, it was, this is the first time I've only like ever painted angels. And it was really fun to kind of look at um, a lot of the angels at the Met and how they're like, you know, how they're treating the wings and things like that. Um, it, yeah, it was just like really fun. And uh, in some folk art, there was like an angel holding a gun. And I was like, that's hilarious. I have to add that. And some angels that are like more like birds, which I thought was really interesting too. So, yeah. Well, here we've got a bunch flying in now, Christy. Here they come. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, is that a figure planting a flag on the distant mountaintop? Yes. Yeah, we've got this sort of uh, conquering figure in the background. Um, so, you know, ideas of like colonization are sort of being tied into, into this piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Tracy, oh, in relation to the band, is it daddy's hands? 
Do you know them? That's amazing. Yes. Are We're the only two in the whole world, Tracy. <laughs> Who knows them? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see them, Tracy? <laughs> um, okay, what else have we got here? I always think of you as a portrait artist. What percentage of your time do you spend with this type of work versus portraits? Ah, oh, um, yeah, maybe my work's like shifted, like. I think the portraits kind of led to the like multi-figure pieces. So at this point, um, some of the pieces are portrait, like that painting um, Whisper at the beginning, where is it? I'm just trying to scroll up. Um, and, they, and it has more imaginative elements, but, um, and then when I teach, I do a lot of portrait classes. So I, you know, really enjoy the challenge of painting the portrait and of capturing people. But I think at this point, um, my work is a little bit more multi, multi-figure kind of compositions. Okay, and we have one from Donna. By putting clothes on your figures, they are rooted in contemporary time. It feels less universal. What is your reasoning for this? Mm, that's a really good observation. Yeah, I do. I like it to be rooted in contemporary time. Um, yeah, I, I, and I think you're right that clothing like really does that. Some of my paintings that I'm working on now are actually nudes and I almost miss that element of the like, very specific contemporary like references. Um, and yeah, I think because like a lot of the pieces are like inspired by the Italian Renaissance or historical pieces, um, but then when we put it, you know, put contemporary figures and contemporary clothing in it, it just immediately like makes us read it in that like contemporary way. And um, the, the artists like from the Italian Renaissance, they were kind of doing the same thing too. Like we look at it and it looks so old, but a lot of them were actually using the landscape of Italy around them and putting figures in there at the time, contemporary clothing in to sort of retell stories, um, you know, in a way that felt contemporary to them. So yeah, I, I like the contemporary elements and sometimes they're not contemporary and you can really kind of feel that tension between the, the ones that are more contemporary and the ones that aren't. Excellent. Well, these are great questions. Um, this is the most recent painting that I've done. This is called Planetary. So it's really like the title of the show as well. And this is inspired by Bosch, Garden of Earthly Delights, where you sort of move from a hell scene over to paradise. And um, in the center, we've got sort of a interconnected web of contemporary figures. These are all my friends. Um, they posed for me from life, uh, most of them, and I'm, I'm in it as well. And then we've got um, some hybrid creatures, mystical, fantastical creatures kind of hanging out in the background, sort of ambiguous whether they're like helping or, well, this one's not very ambiguous. It's definitely kind of threatening. And there's also a little bit of sort of pixelation back here, which just is kind of, Again, this nod to like the digital era and sort of the blending of reality and vir virtual reality in the background. Mm -hmm. And actually I was also looking at a lot of like the Tibetan art at the Met and Indian miniatures. So um, it was really cool to kind of look at some of those for inspiration too. Okay, well, this is just my question. It didn't come in, but you just said, and we hadn't actually discussed this before, that you said that you're also representing the picture. Where, where are you? <laughs> well, I'm the figure being eaten by the evil oh, yeah. cat figure, <laughs> cat flower. <laughs> right, yeah. we just hadn't talked about that before. I was, <laughs> and the hand is sort of making references to um, the Godzilla like movie, like the way that the positioning of the hand is. Right. <laughs> Okay, so we have Aaron says, wow, in all caps. Uh, Dulce says, this is beautiful, sends a few hearts. Uh, Michelle is asking, is this a triptych? Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, it's hard to tell from the photo, but um, it is a triptych. So this is about 10 inches, not about, it's exactly 10 inches by 20 inches and then the center panel is 16 by 20. So it's three panels, yeah. Canvases, three canvases. Yeah. Um, and this is actually a really great question. Just you referenced a few times you're teaching. Diana is asking, where do you teach? Ah, yeah, so I teach, right now I've been teaching on Zoom through the New York Academy of Art. So I've been doing these feature painting classes where we look at like the painting of an eye or the nose or the mouth, or more recently the ear, um, just going into like a lot of the detail about that. I also have a hair painting workshop coming up to kind of look at the 
painting of hair where we'll look at how to mix different colors of different hair. We'll do like red hair, brown hair, gray hair, um, uh, what other color, black hair, and then, and then look more in depth at getting like using different techniques like sanding and different kind of brushes to get the like hair like texture. So yeah, I've got, um, and there's a mouth class coming up at the New York Academy of Art via Zoom on the 22nd. You guys could see if anyone's interested all the information on my website on the classes tab. So it's just christygordon.com um, slash classes. They would be very fun to take. Thanks. <laughs> uh, we have some, another question from Dulce. Do you make your own canvases? Ah, um, what I've been doing is like buying a canvas and then gessoing it like multiple times. Um, so yeah, using, I use acrylic based gesso and I put like multiple coats of gesso sanded in between layers uh, and sometimes even palette knifing it down until it's just super smooth. I actually like it better than linen because linen is really, um, it can really change depending on the humidity of the room. So you'll find that linen is stretched tight when one minute and the next minute you look in, it's like, not tight <laughs> anymore. So I like canvas better because it's like not so humid sort of, um, it's not so affected by like the changes in the temperature and the humidity. But then if you put multiple coats of gesso sanded in between, it's as smooth as, as linen. Perfect. Uh, Linda says, beautiful work. Sandra <laughs> says, beautiful color harmony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Carol, Sounds like maybe she's been a student of yours before because she says Christy is not only an extremely talented artist, but also a phenomenal teacher. Oh, thanks, Carol. And it's nice to hear you. Actually, I want to scroll through all the videos of you guys just so I can see you one more time. Oh, it's so good to see you all. <laughs> hi, everyone. Oh, I see so many people that I know. It's so good to see you guys. Oh, wow. <laughs> I see so many people that I know. Yeah, lots of people who've even posed for me. So good to see you. Oh, some of your muses in the crowd. Yes. Yep. Students, muses, and artists, and other um, art connections and professionals. So good to see you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just mention again, um, until maybe more comments or questions come, that as I, in the introduction, that there are some interesting, um, like the Kootenai Co-op radio interview and whatnot, and I think I might have forgot to mention there uh, that Paul, our executive director, in your Friday's reminder email about this meeting, um, actually put a few of the links right into that email, so if you want to jump over to uh, back to that email, you can find the links to a few of the different things where Christie's show has been featured right now. And I suggest checking them all out because they're all pretty great. And um, yeah. yeah, I would do that. And also you can go to our website at the Langham to if you wanna check out that video again that Christie showed. I think Paul might have added that to the email as well, but it, that'll definitely be up on our uh, website uh, at the Langham as well as um, a virtual gallery tour for those who are joining us from far and won't actually be able to come and see it in person it's it's about as good as you could get hopefully it'll do <laughs> for, it's, it doesn't nothing can really do these paintings justice not in person but it's as good as we can do in these covid times so we invite you to check that out as well yeah i actually really love that digital 3d view that you guys made i like that you guys that everyone can sort of see the installation and just see how it looks like hanging in the gallery so yeah Oh, and, and I see, so Denise here is saying, where's the virtual gallery tour link? So that'll be up at the langham.ca. Just go to our main page and there's links to Christy's video as well as the gallery tour. Um, and Sarah says, it's really worthwhile to go to Caslow and see it. And I couldn't agree more with Sarah. If you're in the Nelson sort of area within our uh, traveling jurisdiction with all the restrictions, then please do join us. Uh, the gallery is open Thursday through Sunday, 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, mask is required. We've got sanitizing station and these paintings are like so fabulous. If you can see them in person, please do join us. <laughs> oh, yeah, it looks great in person. Mm -hmm. um, and Denise is asking when the show ends and it ends on June 5th or 6th, sat the Saturday or Sunday. Sorry, I don't have my schedule right on hand. Um, there you go. Karen is saying that she has a car load and they'll be coming from the cusp. 
<laughs> Yay, oh, Karen. Nice. That was like a great day out. <laughs> oh, Karen. Oh, very cool. That's great. Good. <laughs> awesome. So does anyone else have any other questions or comments for Christy as we wrap up our hour? Uh, uh, Sherlyn is saying, where will you be posting the Zoom talk? Because I know people who weren't able to be here today. Christy, you're going to put it up on your site. And I think we will as well at the Langham. Yeah, yeah, I'll have it on my YouTube channel. And then, um, yeah, the Langham will have it. What, on your website or something or on the YouTube? Yeah, I'll, Paul will link it with, and it'll be right near your video as well as the gallery tour. Then that way, um, give him a day or two because we'll have to get it from you and whatnot. But yeah, I'm sure there's people who wanted to join that couldn't, it would be nice for them to be able to see it. Um, Michelle is saying, I love the pixelated dye in the back of the painting. And uh, Diana saying, I love Bosch too. <laughs> yeah, Bosch is the best. He's so weird. <laughs> uh, Tracy, thank you, Cedar and Christy. Can't wait to see this in person. Um, Aaron, Christy, what is your favorite museum um, for when we can never travel again? <laughs> are you coming back to, are you in New York again, Aaron? Yeah, the Met's my favorite museum, but also the Natural History Museum, but everything is in New York. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, June, thank you so much. You are one of my favorite artists still. Oh, thank you. And Sandra saying, congratulations, Christy. It was fascinating to see your work. Oh, thanks, Sandra. Yeah. Well, that's really sweet. It's so good to have everyone and see so many familiar faces. It's yes. so nice to spend this hour with you all. Yes. So Marianne is sending uh, thanks, or sorry, this has been great, Christy. Thank you so much. And Sherlyn says, thanks to the Langham and Christy for having the show here so we could get to see these in person. I love seeing and hearing about your work today. And Jerry says, yes, beautiful work. Aww, everyone thank you. thanking you so much I guess we're all so excited I hope that everyone who is in the area can see them in person and uh, I'm glad that we were able to do this so at least everyone could see even if they can't join us yeah I'm really glad we were able to do this too and yeah it was so good to see everyone and I'm glad you like my new work and yeah hope you enjoy the show if you get a chance to see it in person Yes, uh, Judy and Russ are saying hello from Ottawa, Christy. We have loved your work for years and bought one many years ago. All the oh, best to you. Oh, thank you. It's so good to hear from you. <laughs> many admirers, eh? <laughs> so nice that we can all be here from all over the world too. All my different art worlds colliding in one place. It's very cool. It's mm -hmm. awesome. It's really, it, yeah, in this time of COVID, if we can't be in person, this is a, a good second anyway. And uh, then we can also revisit it, which is great. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. So I, I think that's it for us. Christy, is there anything else you want to add or? Um, no, I think that covers it, but it was just so great to have you guys all here. And it's so good to see you all. So thank you all for coming. And yeah, I hope you all enjoy the show and have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have an excellent rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.